With the passing of time, things forgotten or neglected come back into focus. And I think this is especially the case in the example set in the field of learning by Francis Bacon. Sir Francis Bacon, Lord Verulam, Viscount St. Alban, High Chancellor of England, was one of the universal geniuses of all times. I suppose that he could be listed in the same classification as Leonardo da Vinci, who took all knowledge as his province. Bacon's position in learning is unique, for in his personality and in his skills, he made possible within his own nature to achieve a unification of knowledge, which is very seldom to be found in any one personality. Bacon's areas of skills included, first of all, the legal profession. In this, he went to the highest possible office, next only to the king in power. As high chancellor and as legislator, he was the outstanding genius of his time. Scarcely less important were his advancements in learning. He was probably the father of modern science, and his entire approach toward knowledge was highly scientific. He recognized the fallacies in the academic traditions of his time and laid the foundation for what we call the inductive system of reasoning. Under inductive reasoning, science rose from a pitiful background to one of the most powerful positions in the world today. Scarcely less important were his contributions in philosophy. He was a philosopher of great parts, a person whose intellectual skills enabled him to integrate most of the great philosophical systems that had preceded him. He was not only a powerful Western thinker, but in a large number of his specialized philosophical researches, he seems to have instinctively fallen into a considerable part of Buddhist philosophy, although he probably did not know it. Next in importance, of course, was his literary output. He was a writer of extraordinary genius. His essays, written when he was a young man, are still considered to be one of the perfect examples of English literature. In an immense vocabulary and a wonderful power of turning uh, well meditated and well considered thoughts. In his field of literature, he was a poet. He also transcribed and poetized a number of the Psalms of David. It is believed, on pretty fair foundation, that he was also the final editor of the King James Version of the Bible. In addition to these numerous and highly diversified accomplishments on the intellectual and material levels, he was a devoutly religious man. His prayers, the attorney's prayer, the student's prayer, are simple, humble, and magnificent expressions of an indwelling expression of the presence of the divine in his own daily life. His uh, secretary and chaplain, Dr. Raleigh, said of him, if ever the light of God descended upon any man in this century, it was upon his lordship. For although he was a great reader of books, his knowledge came not from books, but from some deep hidden source within himself. Now, we kind of think of this as an extraordinary combination. But this combination should, unfortunately, not be overlooked in estimating his attainments. He was probably one of the best qualified persons to approach the problems of daily life. As a scientist, he had these basic abilities, skills, and procedures. As a scientist, he created the modern scientific method. At the same time that he was a scientist, he was, as he says, a humble child of God, 
hoping audive always to be obedient to the divine will. We do not produce many geniuses today that have such a span. We find specialists, and against these Bacon himself rose in indignation. He felt convinced that no individual could advance far in any area of knowledge unless he was dedicated, trained, and had within himself an imperishable desire to be of use and service to mankind. All of these make his writings and his philosophy very important. A very brilliant English writer said, quote me a sentence from any of his books and I will tell you who wrote it. This was the peculiar uniqueness of his ability. The principal writings of Bacon that have descended to us, he never completed his great concept, but his most important writings are the Novum Organum, the New Organ of the Mind, and the Augmenta Scientiorum, the Advancement of Learning. In his spare time, he apparently produced some shorter works, and our subject this morning deals with one of these light or slight procedures or productions of his lordship's meditation, the wisdom of the ancients. This little book, which has only less than a hundred pages, is not a really a work in itself. It is a combination or a culling from his more important writings of analogies and allegories which he regarded as archetypal. Bacon's Wisdom of the Ancients would be a, is of great interest to modern dream analysts, those studying symbols, those concerned with meditations, those seeking to transcend the commonplace in the investigation of nature. Bacon was not uh, addicted primarily to ancient learning. He doubted many parts of it. But he realized something which perhaps someday we must all discover, namely that ancient learning is archetypal. He did not use the term, it was not in use in his day. But it arose from something that was not uh, a conscious process of thinking. Mythology to him was a kind of dreaming, the dreaming of the world before the rise of organized knowledge. Mythology is not only the history of prehistoric times, it is a statement of prehistoric thought, of those patterns which are innate in the individual, those archetypal concepts which, though they appear in a thousand forms, are still always based upon some remote subjective experience. Uh, Bacon, I think, would have assumed that these ancient fables relate in a concealed way the experience of prehistory. Those who lived long ago, whose bodies have long been in the earth, but whose strange and wonderful mental concepts, redressed in every age, have come down to us with tremendous moral force. Most of these fables are simply extracts from his other works, but they indicate the thoughtfulness of the uh, mind that conceived and developed them. According to Bacon, this world is not a series of accidents. It is not a production of blind forces. It is not governed by laws of physical matter alone. This world as we know it is a living thing, a tremendous composite. This living thing is ruled over by processes, by principles, and by laws. These laws, processes, and principles, as he tells us in the Wisdom of the Ancients, were personified, clothed, given embodiment in mythology. Mythology, therefore, is a secret language. It is a language which very much like the names bestowed upon the pieces in a chess game. They represent always principles. The deities were not arbitrary despots on some Olympian peak. 
they were the personification of the impulses, the convictions, the ideals, the experiences, the intuitions of mankind from the earliest known time. So considered, we find, I think, that Bacon justifies very much of antiquity. We look back upon the golden age of Pericles in Greece, and Bacon's fables all have a Grecian background, and we realize that in those days the world produced some of its most important and powerful minds. Pythagoras, who gave us essentially ancient science. Plato, the philosopher of his age and of his time. Orpheus, the great inspirer of religion among the Greeks. These persons and hundreds of others, Euclid, Demosthenes, Antisthenes, all the great minds of that time certainly did not believe uh, that the gods were a group of despots sitting on the top of Mount Olympus. The bullfinch fables that have come down to us are simply the outer cover. Just as in every religion we find parables, allegories, fables uh, to press home upon us certain truths that might otherwise not be easily recognized. Those today who are concerned with archetypal subjects, who are also wish to test the depths of their own intuitions, would profit considerably by the study of Bacon's little volume on the wisdom of the ancients. I should point out, however, that it was written by a lawyer by an individual whose career physically was very greatly involved in statesmanship. He was the counselor of kings. He was one of the most powerful men in the realm. And much of his interpretation naturally impels him towards the application of principles to the office which he himself held. On the other hand, there are some of these fables that have obviously nothing to do with politics or legislation or legality, but have to do with morality and ethics. And all of them, of course, deeply tinged by Bacon's conviction that a divine power was the source and guide of all existence. So we'll take a few odds and ends from among these fables, and probably most of you have read the children's versions of the Greek mythology. Therefore, you will be uh, able to follow uh, at least the general outline, and perhaps might, you might be inspired to give mythology a second look because of the very interesting things that are contained therein. Bacon mentions carefully that he only selected certain fables. He said that some were too obvious to require analysis. Others had to do with matters beyond the average public ken. But he had chosen those which seemed to him to prove conclusively uh, that this wisdom did exist, and that it is a wisdom which, sad to say, we are in great need of today. So we'll start with one very simple uh, example. Uh, the uh, principal deity of the Greek pantheon was Zeus. And Zeus was the representer of the deities and was the ruler of the mundane creation. He was not the supreme deity, but he was the ruler of the world in its manifestation. He was the god-king of existence. And according to the story, it is said that in one of fable, that Zeus courted Metis. And from Metis, and the, uh, the union of Metis and Zeus, was born Pallas Athena, from the head of Zeus, armed and helmed. Now Bacon points out that he doubts very much if Socrates believed that, in its outer form. He is quite sure that Plato could not have. He was quite sure that the Archons of Athens did not. Therefore, why did they participate in this believing and also uh, follow and preserve these fables? Bacon does not point out, but I think it might be interesting to add at this time, 
that the reason why they accepted this was because they had been initiated into the state mysteries and they knew the key. The rest of the world worshipped the purse, face and surface of things as we do today. But to those who penetrated into the depths of things, the commonplace becomes itself, as Bacon says, so miraculous that no other miracle is necessary. So out of this little line of Jupiter, Metis, and Pallas Athena, he develops a quite an interesting uh, pattern. The word Metis means counsel. Therefore, we may say that power, Zeus, took counsel to wife, and from the union of power and counsel was born wisdom. Now we have to go a little further, though, to understand what was meant by this. Today our word wisdom has very little technical significance. Pythagoras probably gave it a greater significance. Like virtue, it is a very abstract term. The Greeks reserved the term wisdom not to a person who had knowledge or had learning or any of these things at all. Wisdom was the immediate participation and experience of truth. All men sought truth. Only those who found it had it. And only those who had had the mystical experience of identification with truth could be termed wise. This is a very much higher approach to the subject than we have today. In other words, wisdom was a theurgic union with reality. It had nothing to do with intellectual achievement. In the case of the sophists of Greece, it gradually fell into the interpretation of being professional educators. But even the sixth century before Christ, Pythagoras refused to be, a, to be considered wise, saying that only God is wise. And therefore he chose not to be a sophist, but a philosophist, and gave us the word philosopher, meaning a friend of or a lover of wisdom. He uh, never would accept the term of being wise. Now, in the case of Athena also, we have other interesting uh, considerations. Metis, being counsel, gave Lord Bacon, that's the meaning of the word, gave Lord Bacon a concept of the importance of counsel in all procedures. That power must be governed by counsel. And out of counsel and power comes prudence. And out of prudence comes justice. All these things fit together in a series of concatenated orderly procedures, finally ending in the production of Pallas Athena. Now, Pallas Athena herself is a remarkable figure. And first of all, she was the only virgin in Olympus. She never married, she had no love affairs, she lived entirely alone, indicating in itself that wisdom was not involved in any of the secondary procedures of life. Wisdom was complete and eternal in its own nature. It had no affiliation to anything. It was remote and unapproachable, except through the inner experience of the individual. It never compromised. And the suitors of uh, Penelope were the compromisers that attempted to dilute truth. But she never would compromise. She never in any way uh, allowed the absoluteness of her integrity to be damaged. Therefore, she became the patron deity of the city of Athens and has descended to us as that form of integrity which cannot be corrupted. Now this integrity is in the individual, or it is in the world, or it is in the divine plan of things. Therefore we consider, as Bacon does, that Athena represents the inevitable victory of wisdom. Wisdom superior to all compromise, all 
reformation, all change. And to Bacon, this supreme wisdom was eternally and forever the same. Wisdom does not grow. It is born full grown. Wisdom is not defenseless. It bears a shield and a spear. Wisdom is not obvious, for Pallas wore the helmet, and when she closed the helmet she became invisible. These different ideas can be thought about for a long time to test the allegories and the significance of these matters. But Bacon summarized the concept of that true wisdom which we are all seeking as being located in incorruptible virtue, which on the level of government means incorruptible integrity. And wisdom itself defends itself against every assault. No one can ever accidentally achieve it. No one can ever force the gates of wisdom. No one can take over this eternal quality. Now, wisdom of its own nature, being a principle incorruptible, the relationship of knowledge and learning to wisdom, this relationship becomes important. Knowledge and learning and all these are expressions of the ascent of human intelligence rising along the steps of what Bacon calls his pyramid of Pan. Knowledge is like the rung of a ladder above which men climb. It is also a road with many paths, as in the table of Cebes in which persons of every walk of life, every degree of intelligence, every type of conviction, are groping along, always in search of that which is better. They are constantly striving toward wisdom. Their strivings are forever changing. And Bacon, being somewhat of a scientist, liked to point out that the strivings of science are forever changing. One day we have one belief, one day we have another. One scientist supports another, a third contradicts them both. Yet each one, in a way, is dedicated to truth. But to each one, truth is only what he is capable of experiencing. Therefore, Bacon points out that the greatest handicap to the advancement of learning is the human mind. Now here he comes very close to Buddha. He points out that as long as the individual is in captivity to the tyranny of mind, mind will hold him to the conditions with which he is familiar. The biologist will continue to grope along the lines of biology, the physicist along the lines of physics. The astronomer will continue to build larger lenses with which to view the heavens. But all these are not going to end directly in wisdom. Man will discover wisdom by the experience of his own errors. Little by little, he will come to discard that which is not true. It takes a long time. But one by one, his errors defeat him. One by one, his mistakes confuse him. One by one, his false believings fail him in emergency until finally he is stripped of everything that he thought would be able to support him. He is stripped of all his material assets. He is stripped of his concepts of government. He is stripped of everything that he has believed to be adequate. Not because he is told to turn from them, but because they have failed him. And so finally he comes into the gradual realization of the universal plan that underlies everything. And finally, if he reaches the apex of all his seeking, he will come to that mysterious inscrutability, that power which alone is capable of causing all things and maintaining all things for the search for knowledge ends in the achievement of the consciousness of the divine. Uh, this uh, has a message 
even for us in our modern world. A message that we need every day because we are still groping. And in this particular crisis, we are groping as never before. We are experimenting with things that we trust and believe. We are following the dictates of traditions which are insecure, but we have not uh, conditioned and regenerated our own inner lives. Therefore, we are incapable of being wise. And uh, wisdom is not merely the piling up of knowledge. Wisdom is the sorting out of error. And it's only in this way that we can gain the end we seek. Now, another one of the fables that Bacon makes a great point of is the story of Pan. Pan was a nature deity of the very ancient Greeks. He was represented as a creature, the upper part of his body being human, and the lower part the body of a goat. He had horns, and he had a bushy, a bushy body, and he had uh, a pan-like or animal-like face, face of a ram. He also carried with him, wherever he went, a flute or a kind of pipes consisting of seven tubes on which he played the music of nature. Bacon explaining the mystery of Pan tells us several interesting things. He says, Pan is nature. Pan is that part of the world which we can see. Pan is an immense creature extending through many worlds. The lower part of the being is animal, the upper part is human. It is another form of the centaur. It represents the natural diffusion of things, the flowers, the meadows, the ancient ways, the trees, the birds, and uh, the pipes of Pan represent, in a sense, the melody and harmony of natural law. Bacon was convinced that natural law is the highest form of legislation, that there is no law man can create that equals its importance. Also, that no individual, no matter how wise, no matter how skilled, no matter how scientifically trained, can break a law of nature and survive. Therefore, he points out that man, instead of trying to protect himself against nature or exploit it, should have learned to understand it and obey it and love it because it is the hope of his own survival. Bacon was very definite in his realization that man is constantly exploiting and perverting the natural resources of life around him. He regards himself as born to manage, to govern, to administer the world. And Bacon is not so certain, but that this might potentially be true. But he definitely points out that the human being is approaching the matter in the wrong way. That this nature God is not, is not to be denied. That Pan, although we don't see anything that looks like him, uh, in the world is a very real being not because it's an image not because it's a uh, creature that might have been extinct long ago or a mythological animal like the dragon that may or may not ever have existed but because Pan is a being nature is a being nature is not simply earth and dirt nature is not simply stars and comets Nature is a being having within itself one of the most priceless powers that man can possibly understand, natural intelligence. Therefore, the natural intelligence of man made him superintendent over the natural intelligence of his world. But man has departed from this. He has substituted sophistication for natural intelligence. And in so doing, he has brought about a conflict between personal desire and natural law. 
Now, the tendency will be always to assume that man will ultimately attain a victory over nature. But according to the Baconian interpretation of the idea, the only victory that man can ever attain over nature is to form a constructive partnership with it. He can never change one of its rules. He can never justify a fault of his own that is contrary to natural good. He can never destroy the harmony of nature without destroying himself. And the harmony of nature are the, is the pipes of Pan. And he uh, hides in the reeds for the river and plays his pipes. And in the playing of these pipes he produces the melody of life. And the melody of life is in color, in form, and number. It is the perfect coordination of all of the beauties and processes of nature. And all of nature's processes, whether we understand them or not, are intrinsically beautiful. But man, arming himself against nature, has caused those things in which he disagrees with nature to appear wrong. It is the perspective, it is the point of view, it is the individual's own wrong relationship with life that produces the conflicts which we see around us every day. Now, in the ancient times, peoples were close to nature. They lived very much according to the seasons. They planted and they reaped according to the seasons. Animals obeyed natural law. Natural law guided the motion of the insect. It guided everything. And incidentally, it also dominated and ruled everything. So that where man has not interfered with nature, nature has seldom worked a hardship on him. But nature it, it demands the fact that while man's higher life rises above the empire of Pan, for his inner life is not part of material nature. His outer life is part of material nature. His outer life is part of the body of the goat. His inner life is the human head that rises from it. Therefore, uh, to paraphrase a biblical concept, it is the duty of every human being to render unto Caesar, that is nature, the things that belong to Caesar, and unto God, the higher nature, those things that belong to God. Now, Pan was never in conflict with God, essentially. They had a few misunderstandings, but they were ironed out in the course of time. The real problem was that Pan demanded the right to fulfill the destiny for which he was created. And it is also made note in one of the fables, as Bacon points out, that Pan had no had children, no successor. He was alone. Nothing followed him. He gave birth to nothing because he already was the full, complete structure of the natural world. So in the course of time, men began to improve on nature. They began to create various ways of exploiting nature. Now, while these ways were natural and were not affected by dishonorable means, nature was abundant. But a man developed a peculiar ability to commercialize nature. He changed the bounty of God into things to be bought and sold. He put fences around little squares on the body of Pan. And as these fences began to come higher, the, as Solon points out, uh, the mortgage stones appeared on the land when men had to borrow money to pay their bills until finally the land was so covered with mortgage stones that you could no longer plant in it. Also, in the same general type of uh, human mistake, uh, the individual began to fight for other people's little piece of that land. And the harmony of nature was destroyed by the stupidity of human beings. Now, Pan was unhappy about all this. So Pan simply enforced his rules. He did not have to make any aggressive uh, 
judgment in the matter. He did not go out and pick anybody to punish. He simply pointed out in his own experience, as man themselves learned, that there were ways of doing things that were right. And that finally, learning, as we call it in the material world, was the ability to come to understand natural law. That the individual was learned, who not only knew the law, but knew enough to keep it. All other forms of learning which are intended to escape or violate law are shemira. They are monstrosities, demons born out of illegal matings. So Pan went along very well through classical times, and gradually there rose the first great conquering power, Rome. And Rome was the first great colonizer. Rome was the power that took knowledge to gain authority. It trained its statesmen as conquerors. It trained uh, the Roman to put Rome first. And before the situation was over, they even trained them to worship the Caesars as divine beings. Gradually, an expansion and exploitation program started. Man departed from the ways of life. And it is said that the last oracle of Delphi, where they all went to seek guidance, the, law, the last cry of the oracle was, Great Pan is dead. The reason for this oracle was that man had, had exiled the god of nature, had cast him out, had gained the concept or conviction in his own uh, self-righteousness that he was the one who was going to rule the world. And although he outlawed these other powers, he really had not the power to change one single truth of life. In more recent times, we have had a rise in atheism in the world, in which it is no longer cried out that great Pan is dead, but it is even affirmed that, great, that God never existed. But it makes no difference whatsoever in the great pageantry of life. The, the principles that they can recognize were first primary causes. And these causes never change. Those who live along can build cities, build empires, but they must always build according to the law, or that which they build will crumble, no matter how powerful they may become. Nature, though less heard, less listened to, is still supreme. And among the uh, arts and sciences that were heavily influenced of this, of course, was, was medicine. And it was believed that Pan uh, gave to the Asclepiads all the medicines of life in the flowers of the field. That man had given to him every cure necessary for his own illness. Whatever happened, nature had a remedy. But men, in their haste, overlooked this and began finding artificial ways. Instead of following natural law, they used medications to cover their disobediences. And nature went right on being what it always was. Nothing changes. The changelessness of the eternal. All superficial things change continuously. Every generation has its own rules. Every civilization has its own cultures. Every nation has its own heroes. But nature never changes. And that which governed the first man will govern the last. It is not that we are weak when we give up the struggle against nature. It merely means that we are beginning to have a, an inkling of what wisdom really is. So this is, I think, a very interesting and informative fable. It gives us a great many interesting and, in, and invaluable things to think about. 
Another fable that, gave, that Bacon gave close attention to was the story of Prometheus. And Prometheus, he says, signifies providence. Now, of course, you know that this, in the story of Prometheus, he is said to have assisted in the formation of the human being and finding him incomplete, took a bundle of reeds and raised himself to heaven and touched the chariot of Apollo. And where he touched the chariot, the reeds burst into flame. And Prometheus came back and brought fire to man. This is, of course, a very interesting fable, but it goes on beyond this point. Uh, Prometheus was, in a sense, uh, the individual who was against the establishment. Uh, providence. Providence, he says, uh, is a more or less disobedient being, yet part of the plan of things. Perhaps in the words of Mephisto in Faust, he is part of the power that go of good while ever working ill. Prometheus represents individuality. It represents the gradual dawning of selfness within the individual. And this is an act of providence. Providence was a lightning flash that ensouled life. Now what does providence also mean when we analyze it in this particular context? Providence tells us that the human being was intended for a purpose that man was providentially created. There is no accident, no superficial incident, not that a fish crawled out of the water and, and walked away. It is nothing of this nature at all. Man was part of the plan. Providence had ordained him, and Providence became his leader and his guide. Now, while the human being was in a desperate state, of uh, primitive existence, living as an animal or with no particular skills against the pressures of a prehistoric world, living in a, in a, in a world of creatures that were not endowed with any uh, providential capacities, Prometheus brought him fire. And Bacon makes a great point of the fact that fire, on this level of things, was the beginning of civilization. And fire, in the spirit, is the beginning of religion. Uh, the, but in the material world, fire enabled man uh, to gradually attain supremacy over his environment. Fire made it possible for him to uh, cook his food, heat his cave, it made it possible for him to fire pottery. It also gave him the skill to make plows and later, unfortunately, to make swords. So fire was a twofold power, a power for good, which as light brought him out of darkness, and a power for evil, when as force it began to release the innate cupidities and ambitions locked within him. But fire was the beginning of man's separateness from the environment in which he lived. It was the beginning of that providential factor which brought him to the rulership or leadership of the species of the earth. Now, uh, Bacon makes a great deal out of this fire factor. And he also goes on to show how fire as serving all kinds of purposes became in itself a mysterious deity, a deity which uh, apparently is self-born. For well, the fire springs up. When it dies, it is dead, but it never dies as a principle. Every fire on the earth could be put out, and yet fire would come back. Fire 
became a kind of divine agent, a symbol of all the skills, all the powers, all the potentials possible to man. So in uh, the development of this power, the inner nature of the human being gradually divided. And from the unity of his ignorance, he divided his internal into a duality of ignorance. He had two power factors at work. He could use fire to build. He could use fire to destroy. He could use it to make life better for everyone. He could also use it to destroy cities and worlds and perhaps get around to the nuclear hypothesis, which of course was a little earlier, was a little late for Bacon. But in any event, it became the most powerful factor in the world of man's experience. The human being confronted with this was confronted with the supreme opportunity and the supreme temptation. Fire enabled the individual to protect his kind. It also provided him with a means of exterminating his kind. And fire gradually developed into the symbol of what we might call fortune. It became the symbol of wealth. For wealth came out of fire. Even coinage was coined by heat. Fire became the means of bringing the precious metals from the earth. Fires burned on the altars of the gods, and fires also burned in the camps of armies. Thus a strange division began to take place, and according to the Baconian theory, this division under Prometheus was a strange providential force. I think the Bible also gives us, and Bacon was very well acquainted with the Bible, it gives us a clue to this situation in the struggle between Cain and Abel, in which we find the beginning of the struggle between common good and personal ambition. Now, the parent of this problem was Prometheus, who was very personal, and therefore had a great desire to do what he pleased. This factor also was incorporated in the gift which he bestowed, the usage of it was to become the great test of human nature. It was this usage that by which providence would ultimately bring about the redemption of mankind. It was the testing, it was the tempering, and the sword of spirit had to be tempered in the flame of suffering. So suffering became the punishment for mistake. It was not some deity sitting somewhere to punish people. For the mistake and its punishment were one thing, each inherent in the other. The reward for good is part of the good of which it is the reward. They are one simple substance, each producing its own kind inevitably. So providence brought about this struggle for power. And out of this struggle comes another interesting uh, mythological figure, and that is Fortuna, or Fortune. Also sometimes represented by a figure called Fama, or Fame. Now Fame is represented as a human figure standing on a sphere, in one hand holding a bridle, and in the other, an urn. Therefore, fortuna or fame uh, is the measure of so-called greatness. As uh, we know, the path of glory leads but to the grave. Fortune and fame are bridles which destroy the liberty of the individual, and in the other hand, fame holds the urn to hold the ashes of the ambitious dead. So, fame also stands upon a sphere indicating absolute 
insecurity and instability. There is no safety in fortune or in fame. But inspired by the discovery of fire and the rising power of the individual to work his own will upon others, fame and fortune came into existence. And from, those, and from these pressures we have not yet recovered. It represents a matter of lack of insight. Now, Bacon points out very definitely in his more important works from which these fables are extracted uh, that the end of all education has to be the, the discovery of what is intended, that the only truth that is important is that which is concealed in the divine mind that whatever was to be, will be. This was one of the inscriptions on the tablets of Nebuchadnezzar. And it was partly attributed to Nebo, Lord of the Writing Table, in ancient Babylonia. That which has been, will be. And it goes on to point out that every action has a reward natural to itself. And integrity and justice is not that the reaction shall be what we want. The real integrity is that the reaction is that which is necessary to universal good. So in the story of the struggle of Prometheus, we find uh, providence and we find many different factors moving man forward to a series of stages or steps in which he ascends this pyramid of Pan. We find him passing through all the stages uh, that were involved when Prometheus, in a sense, put man together. Uh, Prometheus was among those who are said to have fashioned humanity. And when he put mankind together, he took a, a germ or a seed from all other creatures birds, animals, fishes, insects, everything, and put them inside of man. The result is that man has within himself every level in his body of nature. He is tied to Pan by every cell he has, and he is tied to the animal creation by not only his body, but by his material propensities. His body is of the earth earthy, and the earth is pan and nature. Therefore, the part that rises out of this, the humanity in him, made possible through fire, very often comes into direct conflict with the nature of his lower life. Now, man is not supposed uh, to destroy all these uh, little seeds that were planted in him by which he partakes of all living things, he is supposed to become the Orpheus. He is the one whose sweet music will charm all the creatures of the world. Therefore, through his own harmony, he charms all of the lower parts of his own life. If he lives in harmony with beauty and truth, all of the beasts of his inner life follow patiently and lovingly with him, as in the beautiful legend of St. Francis and the birds. The lower parts of man are not bad. They are simply good and useful parts of his complete economy. The beasts of the field are not bad. But when man declares war upon the beasts of the fields, then there is an imbalance in nature and an inevitable consequence sets in. When the individual disobeys the laws of the nature within himself, he comes in the end to a great tribulation because he has perverted the natural powers. It is his purpose to civilize the animals, not destroy them. And when he ignores his responsibility to the animals around him, 
he also ignores his responsibility to the animal seeds in himself. It's a very beautiful and very uh, interesting, constructive kind of fable. Other fables of the same general type and so forth uh, take uh, considerable thought. There was a time where it says that heaven, he, uh, in fact, Bacon opens his story of the fables with the story of heaven as a great vault in which all things take place. It's almost the alchemical retort, for under heaven is all enclosed the creation as we know it. Now heaven was deposed by Saturn, and Saturn in turn was deposed by Zeus. And Bacon says that by heaven we are to understand the totality of things, and by Saturn, matter. And he gives a great deal of thought to that. We associate Saturn symbolically even today with crystallization and death. Bacon says that Saturn is matter, the material substance from which all things must be molded. And uh, in explaining this, he gives us the fable of Proteus. Now, Proteus was an old hermit uh, who guarded a flock of sheep, and he had magic powers and could conjurate. And anyone who wanted to capture Proteus, which is the symbol of forever change, must ensnare him by magic, and must then wait until Proteus takes on all the different forms that he can assume at will. He becomes every kind of thing that you can imagine. He becomes birds and insects and fish and everything. He becomes visible and invisible beings. But you must continue to hold him. And when ultimately he is forced to return to his natural form, then you can capture him. So this, says Bacon, is the story of matter. This is also the story that we have forever with the changing essences and substances of life. Every form of matter passes through innumerable changes. To capture the mystery locked in matter, we have done everything we can. We observe all of the transformations in which matter rises from the most simple form to the most highly organized creature. We see in matter the Proteus, that substance which can take any and all forms. And in any and all of its forms it may be examined, but it can never be captured except in its natural form. Therefore, we must patiently observe the disguises under which it appears, but never hope to understand it so we can restore it to its native condition. This, I think, was one of the great inspirations behind Bacon's philosophy of life. He was a profound student of matter. He wanted to know how it came into being, where it came into being, what it was all about, because he believed that matter was a series of infinite disguises in which a simple thing becomes increasingly more complicated as the evolutionary processes result in the piling up of mathematical patterns of matter. All these forms uh, may bewilder, but anyone who tries to capture those forms will find they slip through his fingers. He thinks he has found the proper and true form, and as he takes hold of it, it changes. So Bacon points out definitely that there is no way in which we can understand substance, essence, matter, unless we can examine it in its inevitable and natural state, and as he points out, in its most natural and primordial state it is invisible. This uh, leads to the Baconian deduction, namely that we must study things by what they do 
because we cannot find out actually exactly what they are. If we study heaven as the great globe within which all the alchemical experiments of existence uh, take place, we must then seek to know the Creator as represented by the infinite diversity of creation. And here the Creator becomes a Proteus. For one principle, one truth, one reality takes on an infinite diversity of forms and appearances beyond conception. Yet somewhere underneath all this infinite change and diversity there is one simple fact. But man has not yet been able to become simple enough to find it. He assumes that he will discover it through complication. But he, Bacon points out that he must discover it by the reduction of complication and not by the magnification or expansion of this same complicated principle. Always also... Uh, Bacon is concerned uh, with the uh, legistic phase. Uh, we have in his concept the idea of a, a government. He took a long, hard look at the government of Olympus. And he realized, obviously, that in its literal form, it could not be true. But if you took the twelve deities of Olympus and examined their attributes carefully and substituted their attribute quality for their name, you came out with a rather good legal system. You found that all of these beings and powers have a valid part in the administration of the world. That there is no doubt that Underneath the network and webwork of myths, there is a legistic form. There is a structure which can be made applicable to almost any system of government. This is true because this government is stamped and sealed upon the individual. Olympus is within each of us. It is a representation of the type of government with which we administer the small nation of our own personalities. Now many people uh, can't understand how it happened that the Greeks, who were a, a naturally rather thoughtful people, could get along with a god like Zeus, who was a philanderer of good parts, who was uh, supposedly very temperamental, and who was bossed to death by a nagging wife. Now, how all this fits in together uh, to form a divine being seems a little difficult. But Bacon uh, tells us in one of his works, I seem to remember it, that the answer is very simple. All you have to do is look at yourself. There is something in you, the leader of yourself, which for most people is the mind. This mind is Zeus. And if you can find any more irresponsible leader than that, it'd be difficult to imagine. The mind always tells you to do whatever you want to do. It proves to you conclusively that your faults are virtues. It leads you into every type of complication. And if it wasn't for the mind's problems that it creates, you wouldn't need a lawyer to settle them. So if uh, we use ourselves as an example, we see that be the individual in the management of that which he can manage and the only thing we can hope to manage finally is ourselves uh, the, the individual is very delinquent in his managements he does what he pleases this is supposed to be the divine right of kings they have a right to be tyrants the individual forever feels that he has a right to be tyr a tyrant and most are to some degree he also has the right to make and unmake rulers and powers. He has the right to declare war upon the drop of a hat. He has the right to make friends and declare enemies. The right to accumulate anything he wants 
and fight bitterly to prevent someone else from taking it away from him. He is constantly inconsistent in his attitudes and self-centered in the extreme. Therefore, you couldn't imagine a better world god than that. Remember, Zeus is not the great deity. He is, the, the Zeus is a sort of a major domo. He is what the Greeks call the demiurgus, or the lesser deity who rules only over the temporal world. He is accountable to the divine as a good governor of the temporal world and its problems. In the individual, the mind is not actually the supreme power. The supreme power is vested in an invisible spirit to which the mind is accountable, whether it knows it or not. We have the same thing in the Nordic mythology. Odin, or Wotan, is not the supreme god. He is simply the god of the twelve deities dwelling in the pal palace of Asgard. Above him is Allfather, invisible, unknowable, to whom Odin and all other things are accountable. Bacon uses the simple analogy of the uh, of Zeus to indicate this secondary deity for everything is a god of that over which it has dominion and the mind has dominion over the body and the mind because it has this dominion uh, it tyrannizes the body it sets this body into very false procedures and ways in order to prevent the mind from continuing in this procedure, Bacon developed his inductive system of reasoning. Based upon the simple and inevitable truth of the matter, that the mind is the thing that must be improved, that in its present state is hopelessly inadequate. The mind must, therefore, uh, give attention to those things which are above it and not all the time to those things which are below it. Instead of the mind spending its all, its, all its time tyrannizing over the outer world or trying to govern it, the mind should first of all deter, turn its attention to the higher world in order to understand what is necessary and what is wanted. It is that reason that Janus the Roman god has two faces, one which faces the public and the other which faces the god. In uh, this case, the mind must uh, become aware of that which is beyond the mind, because the mind of itself is earthbound. It is bound to the situations which arise from environment, heredity, and circumstances, and it is often the victim very much of the mysterious deity Fortuner on the globe. The opinions, customs, knowledges of humanity change from day to day. They become more complicated, taking new forms as Proteus does, but they do not become solutional. Each new form is a new problem. Each new discovery is a new danger, because the mind is not capable of guiding itself by itself, and when it attempts to do so, it becomes a dictator. So uh, in, the, in the Baconian system, uh, the only answer to the world's problem is to find out what the world wants, needs, and must have according to providence, according to the great laws of things, according to the rules that are inflexible and unchangeable. Another interesting little fable that comes along in connection with this is the fable of, Prometh of uh, Persephone. As Persephone, representing the human soul, is abducted by Pluto and taken into the underworld. Her mother, Ceres, the goddess of nature, descends to the underworld and tries to rescue her. And she is helped in this way by Pan, who is the first to point out where her daughter has actually been abducted. Mercury goes to save her, but cannot do so, because she has already eaten 
part of a pomegranate, the symbol of generation. Therefore, the soul is captured in generation. Finally, however, uh, a, the deities uh, intercede, and Persephone is permitted to return to the upper world half of every year. Now, the meaning lying under this, it seems to be, of course, the, the uh, Ceres and Persephone were both agricultural deities. Therefore, the seasons of growth, summer and winter, become the two halves of the year. In these two halves, vegetation in the winter fails, and it is said that Persephone is locked in the underworld. In the spring, she is released and returns to the heavenly worlds above. But there is another interesting interpretation of this fable. Namely, that the soul descending into body is what, is what makes body fruitful. And all the good and all the true life of, of man is vested in this soul power or soul quality. And uh, when God breathed the breath of life into man and made him a living soul, this was the beginning of man's journey upward toward truth. And the soul, of course, Bacon always aligns to religion, assuming that the spiritual integrity in man is the direct manifestation of soul power, and that the soul it abides in him a part of the time, and at death it departs, but at birth it is reborn. And the soul coming into in, in embodiment is the perpetual guide and guardian of man's life. Uh, the, uh, the legends go on uh, in very many interesting ways. Now, for just a moment, supposing the gods had to take an oath, who would they swear by? Now, the Bacon was a lawyer and probably had a good many perjury cases. This comes to be a problem. It wouldn't be very possible to do as in one book that was written years ago, uh, Heavenly Discourses, uh, God swears by saying, by myself. But uh, the Greeks didn't do it that way. The great oath of the gods was the oath to the river Styx. Uh, the river Styx was the stream that divides the world of the living from the world of the dead. It is forever flowing, never ends and became in Greek mythology the symbol of the inevitable, the immutable and the unchangeable. That which be before gods or men. In other words, the complete mystery of life itself. It was that mysterious power from eternity, the ever-existing essence of life, which was the highest unknowable, for all things that live, from the gods to the smallest atom, live because there is life. And this life, therefore, became the most sacred of all things. And when the gods took an oath, they took an oath to the river of life. All of these are quaintisms in their own way, and they seem strange, to perhaps. But there are tremendous values hiding in these things. There are moral lessons that it seems to me we will all benefit by. And while we uh, are using our natural faculties, it might be interesting for us to see what would happen if we would take some of these legends and interpret them according to our own insight, calling upon the internal to find the meaning of a symbol. And this is the power of symbols, that they bring out of us something. And any person in any walk of life can take one of these myths, bring it down to the level of his own experience, and not only get a, a useful answer, but may also get a clue through the symbolism to the laws involved in the situation in which he finds himself. I think this was the principle and idea that was behind Bacon in the production of these mysterious and truly charming fables. 
and we think that it was an interesting enough subject that we wanted to share it with you. Thank you very much.